Hello and welcome to the Roundtable Podcast. I am Shogun. Today we have a formal debate oh series event between Too High, who will be representing the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and Mr. Matt Slick of the Christian Apologetics and Research Ministry, who will be representing Christianity and Calvinism in specific. Before we get started, please follow us on YouTube and BitChute, where you can find over 200 uh, excellent podcast episodes. And most of all, join us on the Roundtable Discord server. So that being said, welcome, gentlemen. Uh, too high, Mr. Slick, thank you for joining me. It's uh, great to have you. I've been looking forward to this event. I'll ask you in order. Uh, how are you today, Mr. Slick? Well, getting over being sick. My voice is extra raspy, but I'm doing okay. Well, we really appreciate you joining us, and we're glad that your health is recovering. And uh, how are you, Tuha? Well, glad to be here. Glad to still be breathing. If I was doing any better, I'd have to sit on my hands to keep from clapping. Excellent. Well, thank you both again for making this happen. This is part three of a three-part uh, podcast series, a trilogy about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, also known as the Mormons. And uh, without further ado, we've decided that Mr. Slick will take the first turn. This will be a five-round formal moderated debate. Each round will be precisely five minutes. Uh, I will announce the beginning of each round when there is one minute remaining on the, the turn and when the time is up for that debater. After the five rounds, there will be two polls. Uh, we will ask the audience who they thought did better at debating. Also, a separate question, uh, which position they agreed with. And after that, we're going to have an informal question and answer and discussion period. So, without further ado, are you ready to begin, Mr. Slick? <clears throat> yeah, if you don't mind my occasional coughing, but yeah. I'm ready. No problem. All right, then. So round one, uh, you may begin whenever you are ready, sir. All right, thanks. Here goes. All right, so uh, I've been doing apologetics for 40 years. And uh, what started me was uh, Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, who I may or may not quote later, how he boasted he did more than even Jesus to keep a church together. So I started studying Mormonism, and I discovered that Mormonism is a non-Christian cult. And its doctrines, its teachings, are not in compliance with the Word of God, the Scriptures. Mormonism says it was an apostasy, and that Joseph Smith is the one who was chosen by God the Father to restore the truth. So, allegedly, God the Father appeared to Joseph Smith. That's impossible, according to the Scriptures, because the Bible says that God the Father cannot be seen. He dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen nor can see, 1 Timothy 6.16. When they see God in the Old Testament, it's a pre-incarnate Christ. Jesus himself says, regarding the Old Testament appearances of God, that no one has ever seen the Father at any time. And he's talking about that in John 6.46. Uh, so what does Mormonism teach? <laughs> Well, it teaches that there's many, many gods, and you can look up in the stars at night, and the stars have planets. There's probably gods, uh, many, as, as you see the stars. It teaches that one of uh, the gods um, is a, a god of this planet. In Mormonism, God used to be a man, man uh, on another world near a star called Kolob, and he uh, became a god by following the laws and ordinance, ordinances of that god on that planet. Then he ex was exalted to godhood. He brought one of his wives with him to this world. He's about six feet tall. And uh, he has a, a wife who has a body, flesh, and bones. And they have, well, you know, they produce spirit babies uh, in heaven. Uh, they have physical bodies and flesh and bones. They're married in heaven. And, you know, you can imagine what happens to produce spirit babies. There's a mother goddess uh, up there. And uh, <clears throat> after you become a good Mormon, you have to pay a full 10% tithe of your income to the Mormon church. You go into the temple, and nothing kinky goes on in there. But what does go on in there are new handshakes, uh, new hugs, you get a new name. And you're supposed to learn handshakes because you're supposed to shake hands <clears throat> with God when you die so that you have the potential of, uh, of becoming a god of your own planet. And shaking hands means that you've been to the temple ceremony. God knows that you've done this. And uh, they're called the, four, the tokens. So this is what Mormonism teaches. Now, in the Mormon temple ceremony, uh, there uh, are actors who play various parts. And one of them is Satan. One of them is a, um, 
a um, preacher, one of them's Adam, et cetera, et cetera. When Mormons walk into one of the rooms, the chambers in their temple, they're given a green fig leaf apron. It's in a bag. It's roughly nine inches by nine inches, you know, give or take. And it's uh, embroidered fig leaf, green fig leaf pattern. And uh, they, they just have it in a the bag. They have white garments on. They all wear white garments. And they watch a film, and um, Adam asks Satan in the film, what's that apron, that fig leaf apron you have on? It's a black apron. Same pattern, same everything, just the color is different. Satan says it's the symbol of my priesthood and my authority. The film stops. The Mormons are told to put on their fig leaf aprons right after Satan says that it's a symbol of his power and priesthood. The goal of Mormonism is to have as many children as possible because the spirits in heaven are produced from God and his goddess wife who came from that other planet. And you have to, they have to inhabit human bodies here on earth. And hopefully you've been really good in heaven uh, in the pre-existence, and you're born here in one of the bodies here on earth. And you, if you're lucky, you'll be born in the Mormon family, and you get to do all the Mormon stuff and uh, hopefully become a god. It teaches us Trinity is actually three one separate. Minute remaining. It teaches us Trinity is actually three separate gods, and that God is increasing in knowledge, and that God's in the form of a man. And his body of flesh and bones. Uh, they teach that Jesus and Satan are literally spirit brothers along with us. We're all born to God and his goddess wife in heaven. The Holy Ghost is a male personage. And um, also, just so you guys know, Mormonism attacks other religions all the time. And it's more in its uh, temple ceremony and uh, the Mormon missionary um, presentations. They are on the attack constantly. This is a brief introduction of what Mormonism is. And because it teaches a false God and a false Christ, it also teaches a false gospel. It's not Christian. Go ahead. Okay, thank you for that. Absolutely. Just, uh, I just ask you to hold on. And I'll oh, introduce God. each presenter. So you had 10 minutes left. Thank you for yielding. Okay. okay. Uh, when, whenever you're ready to. Uh, round one. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so... The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, commonly referred to as Mormons or LDS, um, it's almost as a tale of two restorations. We have Calvin, John Calvin, who was born in 1509 in France. Uh, he was raised by a staunch Roman Catholic family. I find very, sim very close similarities between him and Joseph Smith, who uh, had half of his ha uh, family was Methodist, the other half was Presbyterian. He just wanted to know which church to join. When he was reading the uh, first epistle of James, chapter 1, verse 5, which says, Let any man who likes wisdom ask, and it shall be given him liberally, and abrade it's not. He said, Oh, all I have to do is ask. From that, um, the restoration occurred. And we have two very, very it's either a perpetuation of the gospel from ancient times or restoration in latter days. For if the Catholic Church's position is correct, there's no need of Joseph Smith and Mormonism. And the Protestants are apostates whom they cut off long ago. But if the Catholic Church has not the apostolic succession from St. Peter's, they claim, then Joseph Smith was necessary. And Mormonism's attitude is the only consistent one. In regards to Joseph Smith, the unlearned farm boy at the age of 14, I find it fascinating in, in that at the age of 14 also, Calvin went to Paris to study at the Collège de Marche in preparation for his university studies. And his studies consisted of seven subjects, grammar, rhetoric, logic, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music. Toward the end of 1523, Calvin transferred to the more famous Collège Montaigu. Sorry if I botched that. While Paris, he changed his name to its Latin form, which is not the first time he's changed his name. Over time, he developed new theological teachings of individuals like Luther and many others spreading throughout Paris at the time. Um, Calvin was closely tied at that time to the Roman Catholic Church. However, by 1527, Calvin had developed friendships with individuals who were reform-minded. Yet another theme of restoration. Ever since the Lord told the apostles, go ye into the world and spread the truth and the fullness thereof, they all went and were killed but one they never had a chance to reconvene and to pass on that essential priesthood by the laying on of hands very important very few sects and denominations and people who claim to be followers of christ claim to have that direct lineage and, and authority 
Those contacts set the stage for Calvin's eventual switch to the Reformed faith. It was also at the time when Calvin's father advised him to study law rather than theology. In regards to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Joseph Smith, the unlearned farm boy, went out into the woods, had a vision. Yeah, there's a couple accounts of it. As time went on, he felt more comfortable sharing more of the details, because I'm sure how you could feel if you had seen God, you knew it, you knew God knew it, you would not deny it. You would tell your family, you would tell your friends, you would tell your neighbors. Imagine the type of rhetoric and things that people would say unto you, for how dare you even retort yourself to be a follower of Jesus. Said, I myself thought the same thing when I first heard the Book of Mormon. I didn't grow up in this church. I grew up Baptist. And I can remember when I got home and I was baptized. After I was baptized, I turned on the TV and I saw a commercial for the Book of Mormon, another testament of Jesus Christ. And I said to myself, "Why? who are they to say they have anything more in the Bible? It says in the Bible you're not supposed to add there to or take their wits. And I stopped and noticed and realized I was getting angry. And I remembered it. anger. And those feelings only come from one place. They certainly don't come from, from above. Because just as Joseph Smith proclaimed, surely God can be the remaining. author of, of confusion. In regards to Kolob, Kolob is a star named to the given to the star closest to the throne of God in Abraham 3.13. Um, it's found in some ancient records translated by Joseph Smith. Uh, he didn't really give a full description or explanation of Kolob, nor did he assign the idea of particular significance in relation to the church's core doctrines. It's in Ahem. As far as the Lord, as far as the Heavenly Father being a flesh and bone, well, he did make us in his image. He walked in the garden. Um, I'm not surprised that we have maybe have a Heavenly Mother, but he reserved her name because he didn't want it blasphemed. So that I'm okay with. And as far as the Council of Nicaea and the things that were changed 400 and 800 years after Christ died. They couldn't get the Greeks to accept Christianity, and so they changed the nature of God into a spirit because the idea of a tangible God is incompatible with Greek philosophy. As far as temple ordinances, well, many plain and precious things are done in the temple to remind us of our covenants and so that we learn lessons. And I defer. Thank you. You used all your time perfectly. So give me one second. To reset the clock. Okay, Mr. Matt Slick, uh, round two. You may begin whenever you're ready. All right, thank you. All right, so we talked about John Calvin. That's nice. Uh, apostasy. Uh, you misquote uh, James 1 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously without reproach, will be given to him. The context is believers. Wisdom is a proper use of knowledge, it's not a, a uh, Recommendation to pray about the Book of Mormon, Moroni 1032, uh, in order to see, or 104 actually, uh, to see whether these things are not true is what the Book of Mormon says. You don't pray about a book to see what is tr if it's true or not. You assume the apostasy, but there was no apostasy. Second Thessalonians 2, 1 through 3 says, Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by his spirit or a me message or a letter as to as uh, to us, from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come until the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. You'll notice the man of lawlessness is uh, arrives with the apostasy. There is no man of lawlessness on the scene right now. There was no apostasy. All the cults, I've studied many, many of them. Uh, most cults will say, yeah, there was an apostasy, and our prophet or our prophetess, our seer, is the one who restored it because we had a vision, we had got plates, we got whatever, and our group is the one who says it. And all you got to do is compare it with Scripture. He said uh, he was an unlearned foreign boy. Uh, Mr. <laughs> you should uh, do some more research. On my website at karm.org, you can go and look up, um, <clears throat> look up the information by E.W. Howe. The uh, the first anti-Mormon book written in 1834, and eyewitnesses uh, swore before magistrates, before judges, ministers, uh, about the Joseph Smith family. They wouldn't trust them as far as they could throw an elephant. They were involved in the occult, money digging, con games. This is what the facts are. He wasn't just some innocent uh, farm boy. Uh, he was involved in all kinds of, of, of uh, charlatan uh, endeavors. You misquoted Genesis. Uh, 
126, made in the image of God, uh, you don't understand, no offense meant, but you don't understand the communicable and incommunicable attributes of God. Uh, God is not a spirit, as Jesus says in Luke 24, 46, God is spirit in John 4, 24, and spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have, uh, Luke 24, 45, I believe it is, that Jesus said. So God is not, a, does not have a body of flesh and bones. This is what, this, what Jesus himself said, John 4, 24, John, uh, Luke 24, 45. So you misapply Genesis 126. Now, a lot of people don't know this. I got to say it quickly. I got two, just under two minutes. The book of Abraham supposedly was translated by Joseph Smith, and he did it by putting a stone in a hat and then putting the hat over his face, and then Oliver Cowdery on another side of a veil would supposedly uh, write down one letter at a time. Joseph Smith, as he translated the book of Abraham, was supposed to be perfect and all that. Well, it's got thousands and thousands and thousands of changes in it since then but nevertheless joseph smith purchased some legitimate for real uh egyptian papyri absolutely legitimate uh and he said that it was uh, the book of abraham which is now one of the sacred scriptures of, of mormonism and he translated it by the same power he did the book of mormon he said the very same power well the book of abraham papyri were lost until 1967 they were discovered in um a basement of a, of a library. You, the Joseph, I mean, uh, the LDS Church admits it is the same papyri, absolutely the same one, as Joseph Smith's handwriting on the back of this papyri. So, hey, he's got this ability to be a prophet and a seer, restore everything. Well, they said, hey, now you can see how great he is. So they uh, started translating the hieroglyphics, and lo and behold, had absolutely nothing to do with the book of Abraham. Oh, the book of Abraham, that, that his book of Abraham had nothing to do with what the actual hieroglyphics actually said. It was a book of the breathings of the dead. Joseph Smith said he did the book of Abraham by the power of God the same way he did the book of Mormon. And it can be proven, proven that he lied about the book of Abraham. He said he did it by the power of God. He said it was the book of Abraham. It was not the book of Abraham. If you have any doubt about that, go to my website. Carm.org and look up the Book of Abraham. Go to the Mormonism section. There's like 140 articles I've written, and you can uh, check out that. Yeah, and you can check it out, and you can see the documentation. Joseph Smith lied. Joseph Smith was involved in the occult. He didn't restore anything. He was a con man, and Mormons, unfortunately, have been duped by this con man throughout history. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Just uh, thank you. Yeah, one second. And when you're ready, too high, this will be round two. Or, yeah, is this round two or three? I'm sorry. This is two. two. Yeah, I'm sorry. Round two. Whenever you're mm -hmm. ready, sir. Sure. Thank you. Um, the apostasy was foretold, and the apostles struggled against it for their whole careers, for Calvinism at its core, and everyone that came after the Catholic Church. Constantine came on the scene. I think it's pretty well accepted. He says, I'm God's author as representative now. You're going to listen to me. You're not going to listen to the apostle Peter. Claimed to uh, convene the many councils of Christendom. Violence, 1900 years. Spiritual dark ages. Look at, look at the denominations and all of the branches that came after that. Surely, God cannot be the author of confusion. So to say that the apostasy was not foretold, I mean, the, the apostles themselves struggled with it. And so I ask you, sir, which version of the Bible do you view to be true and correct? The King James Version that we believe is a core fundamental tenet in one of our articles of faith is that we believe that the Bible is true and correct. And as far as it is accurately translated, we all agree that King James said if it's not in there twice don't put it in but the king james version of james 1 5 if any of you like wisdom let him ask of god they give us to all men liberally and upbraideth not and it shall be given him the apostasy was foretold there were members lusting for power who would not recognize those with authority much of the new testament is a witness to the fact that the churches would deviate from the truth without apostolic guidance if not so why was calvin so impressed after finishing his law studies, this was a very learned lawyer who really, for all intents and purposes, had a lot to benefit and gain. I mean, he hung around with those who were all pushing for Reformed faith, who were defined as heretics by those in the Catholic Church. 
much of the New Testament is a witness to the fact that the churches would deviate from the truth without that guidance. And if everything was moving along fine, then why did Paul, for example, spend so much time answering questions, correcting errors in doctrine, and trying to persuade people to change how they are running the church? One must remember the letters aren't to the unbelievers, they're addressed to the erring Christians. As far as things being true or not true and being tossed to and fro, the Merriam-Webster dictionary definition of a cult is any group surrounding a centralized figure. So I would be careful throwing that around. Christianity is a cult of Judaism, is it not? The witnesses of the Book of Mormon, the three of the witnesses who left the church, two returned, and one on their deathbed gave confession that they saw the plates. Kind of hard. I mean, you want to go, you know, pound for pound, witnesses against witnesses. You know, that, that can easily be made. It's well documented. In, in Genesis, man is made in the image of God. Okay? And the method that Joseph Smith used in his translation method, as he was learning and becoming versed in the ability to translate this, he started off with the manner that you described. But that wasn't the entire way that he translated it. The power of God, if God can do anything... We can do all things. We believe in modern revelation. Why would God choose to stop talking to his children? Why would he put it all of his, rest all the laurels on one person? And that's the difference. We as Mormons, we don't go around wagging our finger, banging on a Bible, preaching hellfire and damnation to try to win converts. We don't fault find. Even Calvin himself proclaimed to have the ability and the, and the de desire, inherent desire to seek truth. Just as we do, we find a very similar spirit with uh, Calvin and many others. So when it comes to prophets, how do you tell a true prophet from a false prophet? In my opinion, I think it's easier to tell a true prophet from a false prophet when the prophecies have already come to pass. But you must be careful. What if the prophecies have yet, have yet to come to pass? And so we must be very careful. In regards to the, to the papyri, the majority of the papyri remains lost, and it's likely been destroyed. And so to rest the laurels and crux of an argument of something that doesn't, we don't even have anymore, I mean, I, I, I appreciate that he had, uh, you know, uh, it was Henry Eyring, Reflections of a Scientist. He says, an example of what I'm taking about this recent discovery of the papyrus scrolls from which Joseph Smith was presumed to have translated the book of Abraham and the Pearl of Great Price. Modern scholars looking at the scrolls found nothing considered to be similar in that book. I remarked at the time that such a finding didn't bother me in the least. God doesn't need a crib sheet in order to form a papyrus scroll to reveal Abraham's thoughts and words to Joseph Smith, which any degree of precision he considers necessary for his purposes. If only the function of the scrolls was to to awaken the prophet to the idea of receiving such inspiration, they would have fulfilled their purpose. And I can see. Thank you, sir. We will now be moving on to round three of the debate. Whenever you're ready, uh, Mr. Slick, you may begin. All right, thank you. Uh, you said the apostasy was foretold. Yes, it was. Apparently, you ignored what I read out of God's word in 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 3. The apostasy is concomitant with the arrival of the Antichrist, which has not happened. So you need to reassess that. Constantine did not say that he was the one you had to listen to and not the apostles. Uh, if you can argue, argue with facts and not with misinformation. Um, you said look at the denominations and different denominations. I will admit that denominations within Christianity is an embarrassment. It is. Uh, but the denominations occur in what's called the adiaphora, the non-essential doctrines. And um, <clears throat> uh, there are, just so you know, there's over 100 branches uh, of Mormonism that use the Book of Mormon to be true. So that, uh, that sword cuts both ways. Which version of the Bible do I use? I like the NASB, and uh, I get into the Greek and the New Testament since I've had four and a half years of Greek in college and, and graduate school. Uh, you quoted the eighth article of the LDS Church. You should really think about that because it says the Bible is correct insofar as it's correctly translated, not interpreted. Translated means from one language to another language. And guess what? It is accurately translated. I can do the Greek at least. Uh, <clears throat> he said that without apostolic guidance, there was a loss of truth. Uh, that's what the uh, Roman Catholic Church says, the Eastern Orthodox Church says, the um, LDS, I mean, excuse me, the Jehovah's Witnesses say, it's, all, it's a common theme inside of uh, non-Christian groups when they say things like that. Uh, that. Their church, their authority, their whatever, is the restoration, and they have the right to interpret everything, and etc. Um, well, just saying it doesn't make it, it true, but you have to understand something. Paul did write and corrected a lot of errors, and that's why we have the New Testament. He wrote 
to correct all kinds of stuff. In fact, he refuted the idea of many gods as Mormonism teaches. And just so we can be straight on this, in Isaiah 43.10, 44.6, 45.8, it says that God doesn't even know of any other gods or aren't any other gods created, period. And uh, yet Mormonism says there's many, many gods. You become gods. And the Bible even says there's no gods formed after him, but Mormonism contradicts that. Um, <clears throat> Paul, back to Paul, wrote to correct errors, and he said in one of his corrections in 1 Timothy 6.16 6, that God the Father, speaking of God the Father in a context, was an unapproachable light who no man can see or ha has seen or can see or can see. Joseph Smith said he saw God the Father, therefore Joseph Smith lied. Joseph Smith was a con man. Case is over. Mormonism is falsified. It's, it's proven to be false. Now, it doesn't matter if your so-called witnesses in the Book of Mormon uh, believe or say whatever they did because, uh, well, that's under discrepancy with, with the facts. Something you should study as, as, uh, as well. You talk about a translation in principles. You see, the thing is that the Mormon church itself said that the Book of Abraham was uh, from this papyri. It was the thing that was defending the idea that this, the Book of Abraham papyri was exactly the Book of Abraham. And since they had lost it, there's no way to to, uh, to find it out. And then once they did find it again, and then they proved that Joseph Smith was inaccurate, then the Mormons tried to cover their bases and say, well, actually, it was just something used to inspire Joseph Smith uh, to translate. So he went one letter at a time. This is Joseph Smith's words. Uh, a seer stone, which is supposed to be a stone out of the, the, the Urim and Thummim, uh, because in Mormonism, you guys don't know this, but... Uh, the Garden of Eden is in Missouri, and so the high priest was there and stuff. He got a stone. And so he's supposed to be able to translate the book of Abraham this way. So that means that he would see a letter appear in the book of Abraham, and then he would repeat it, and it would be recorded. This is how it's supposed to have been done, even though it's been changed. The book of Mormon has been changed a great deal. Now, how do you tell a true prophet from a false prophet? Well, I think what I'm going to do is save my – One save minute that is save that for the next opening. I'm going to show you. I'm going to answer your question. I'm going to answer your question. How do you tell a true prophet from a false prophet? I, the next thing, I plan to deal with many of the false prophecies of Joseph Smith. He's a false prophet. And if you believe in Joseph Smith and in Mormon gospel, you're going to go to hell. I don't say this with pleasure. I don't say it with arrogance. I'm not mad at you. My heart breaks for you. You've been deceived by a false prophet, a false teacher, a con man. The evidence is there, and you go with your feelings over the facts. And I don't want you to die and go to hell. Uh, he's a false prophet. And we'll get into I'll get into that in the next segment. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, just uh, allow me to read. So this will be the beginning of round three for Too High. And Mr. Too High, uh, whenever you're ready, you may begin. Thank you. So the first vision has always brought up. Let's 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 just go with what Joseph Smith said. And we we as LDS, and one one thing I appreciate about the members of this church is that free will and agency is the core fundamental tenet. It is the foundation. It is what the war in heaven was fought over. It wasn't and 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 you know you you'd mentioned that well Jesus Christ and Lucifer were brothers. Well you know, we're all spirit brothers and sisters, aren't we, in one way or another? And we can get into the nature of uh, interpretation and opinions of what angels are and what that constitutes resurrected beings and the like. But when the prophet Joseph Smith, and I have no problem calling him a prophet. There's many things in the church that I'm able to say, mm, that's plausible. I can think about it. I don't have to be controlled. I don't have anyone banging on a Bible telling me I'm going to hell. When Joseph Smith had the first vision, if this is true, this is one of the, save aside from Jesus Christ himself and the atonement and implementing the plan of salvation, right? This is the biggest mic drop in all of history. If, when the prophet saw the two personages, one of them pointed at the other and said, this is my beloved son, hear him. He, Joseph Smith said, as soon as he could open his mouth, he says, which church should I join? I think that's a pretty righteous question in my opinion, but... The other personage says, join none of them, for they draw close to me with their lips. They are far from me with their hearts. They teach for the doctrines and commandments of man, denying a godliness thereof. In my opinion, if Jesus Christ came back and saw some of the things being done in his name, I don't think he'd call himself a Christian. He'd probably call himself a Mormon. 
there were so many things that even at the end of Paul's life and mission, he noted that all of those whom he had taught in Asia had turned away from what he taught. If that's not an example from the, you, I'm sure you agree that the Apostle Paul was a true apostle, as we all do. But that's his words. So much of the New Testament was unfortunately given to trying to write letters, not to unbelievers, but to Christians. And as far as many gods, Abraham's father was an idol maker. There was thousands of gods, tens of thousands of gods. Abraham just wanted to know who to say thanks to, right? Through God, all things are possible, right? So why is it such a misnomer and thing, hard belief that God may choose to reveal himself, as he has many times before? I don't think God comes down on a pillar of fire anymore, because uh, he doesn't have to. Christ fulfilled many, many things, and we're that grateful for that. As far as the opinion of the Garden of Eden being in Missouri, that's an opinion of an individual. They're welcome to their opinion. I'm welcome to my opinion. You're welcome to yours. And as far as the papyrus, to try to put the crux of the whole religion on a few pieces of a manuscript that may or may not still be available the Kirk, uh, kirtland egyptian papers i believe is what you're you're referring to the pieces that were found and collection of documents written by various individuals but let's go back to the uh, apostasy because from the catholic church's perspective they are right and as a calvinist you are wrong right why did calvin and Luther and many others fight sometimes violently very violently. We're talking about violence, okay? Constantine did convene many things, and he gave an ultimatum. If you didn't attend, what would happen? And look what happened. I mean, this was Rome we're talking about. He infused the church into Rome, right? And for the, aposto for, for the apostolic succession from St. Peter, I have always had a problem with that. I'm sorry, the Council of Nicaea and the subsequent Nicene Creed, I have always had a problem with them changing the nature of God into a spirit, this impersonal God. God is a spirit, immovable, immobile, omniscient. We know everything about him. We don't know anything about him. Come on. They couldn't get the Greeks to accept Christianity, so they once again changed many things in order to win converts. Joseph Smith at the time, half his family was Methodist, the other half was Presbyterian. It was at the time of the Great Revivals. And I find it fascinating. At the time when people would stand on a stump or, or a cart and try to out-preach and out-shout each other, and their litmus and test of success was who, how many converts they had. I'm grateful that we still have modern revelation, that, that God still chooses to talk to us. At the end of Paul's life and mission, he noted, like I said, that all those whom he had taught in Asia had turned away from whom he had taught. So no need. There's, there's totally a need for a restoration. And, and I think it was – you, if you believe that the prophet Elijah was a true prophet, he said there would be two sticks, both witnessing of one. Well, those two sticks are the Book of Mormon and the New Testament, witnessing of one, one being the Redeemer. Can say Thank you. This will be round four. Uh, Mr. Slick, whenever you're ready. All right. Uh, the two sticks spoken of, just read down, further down in the chapter there, and you'll find that uh, it's spoken of and fulfilled right then and there. It has nothing to do with the Book of Mormon. It has to do with the uh, nation of Israel and Judah. Again, you fail to um, read the context of things. The first vision... Um, <clears throat> Uh, you admitted uh, you saw God the Father. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 6.16, 6, the Bible says, Paul the Apostle said, in the inspired written word of God, that the Father dwells in unapproachable light whom no man has seen or can see. So you are calling Paul the Apostle a liar, saying Joseph Smith saw the Father. Now, <clears throat> Joseph Smith did join a church after supposedly God told him not to join. It's well documented that he did that. Maybe you're just not aware of that. Furthermore, you brought up the idea of Christians fighting each other. Uh, you should be careful about that, considering the Mountain Meadows Massacre on 9-11, 1857. The, the Mormons in southern Utah uh, murdered 124, give or take, no one really knows for sure, men, women, and children. And uh, what they did was they started a wagon train. The wagon train had uh, was called the Missouri Wildcats in there. It's like a, a stupid group of guys who said they had the gun that killed Joseph Smith. It was stupid to say. It was stupid to do. And uh, so there was some, um, let's just say, some disharmony uh, among the groups. And the wagon train ended up doing, you know, just a wagon circle, you know, defending itself. And they were running low on supplies. The Mormons were attacking them. And uh, so they surrendered. Uh, the Mormons said that, that if they gave up their guns, 
think about the Second Amendment, folks, uh, gave up their guns, uh, then they could walk out of the valley and they'd be free. And so the, uh, the wagon trainers gave up their guns and um, the Mormons killed them, uh, killed them. Took the children under seven years old, took them back and uh, took care of them until the relatives came out and got them. And then the Mormons char charged them for a uh, room and board uh, called the Mountain Meadows Massacre. You can look it up, the Mountain Meadows Massacre. Uh, God is spirit, and I misquoted the verse earlier, I'll correct it. Uh, God is spirit, uh, that's John 4, 24. God is spirit. Jesus says, God is spirit. And what you did was you contradict Jesus. You said that uh, the, the councils uh, changed it because of Greek this and that. It's a common thing that I hear from people. Oh, the Greeks this, and they had to get, because they wouldn't accept it. They changed this. And you get no evidence of this. The Bible says, Jesus says in John 4, 24, God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. John 4, 24, the words of Jesus. You say he's got a body of flesh and bones. Well, Luke 24, 39, Jesus says, after his resurrection, see my hands and my feet, that I myself touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. He says a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And he says God is spirit. Now, um, <clears throat> Joseph Smith uh, Joseph Smith is not a true prophet of God. And I don't know, how much time have I got left? I just lost my page. Are you there? How much time have I got? I'm Hello? sorry, sir. a minute and 40 seconds. A minute and 40 seconds? Okay. Joseph Smith prophesied that Jesus would return within 56 years of his time. That's in History of the Church, Volume 2, page 189. It was false. The Doctrine and Covenants prophesied that the temple would be built in, in Missouri within Smith's generation. That did not occur. All nations would be involved in the American Civil War, that he prophesied. Doctrine and Covenants, 87, 1 through 3. That did not happen. Prophesied that the earth would tremble and the sun be hidden in not many days. Uh, Doctrine and Covenants, 88, 87. That did not happen. He prophesied that Isaiah 11 would be, uh, was about to be fulfilled in uh, the Pearl of Great Price. Uh, that, incidentally, folks, is when the lamb and the lion lay down together, etc. That did not happen either. You want to ch check for a false prophet? I've got the documentation on my website. Just go to it, carm.org, C-A-R-M dot O-R-G, and look up Joseph Smith's false prophecies, and they're documented. They're right there. Okay, go ahead. I'm done. Okay. So that concludes uh, round four for Mr. Slick. And we will now begin round four for too high. Uh, you yielded 20 seconds, 25 seconds. So whenever you're ready, uh, too high, round four. Yes, thank you. So throughout all of the Bible, the Old New Testament, there's many notable examples of phenomenon, in, for example, in the New, Old Testament, including a pillar of smoke and fire that accompanied the wandering Israelites. Who were they talking to in Exodus 13? I don't know. Clouds and fire that surrounded and emanate from God, Psalm 97.2, and the cloud that filled the temple, equated with the glory of God, 1 Kings chapter 8. Ezekiel also describes the fire and brightness of God. In each instance, God's physical presence is manifest by the kabod. And it, but his physical form is simultaneously hidden. So I have no problem with when God chooses to come as whatever and how he sees fit. That's his business, not mine. I don't think that the manner and the method that he chooses to come is more important than why he came. And we can all agree, yes, it is sad to see how much violence occurred throughout all of Christendom of many people fighting and persecuting one another over who's God's authorized representative, right? In regards to the Mountain Meadows Massacre, I think a lot of times people gloss over the fact that the governor of Missouri put out an extinction order to shoot on sight men, women, children, Mormons. They massacred the Mormons who were moving into Missouri because they Mormons and the church was abolitionists. They didn't believe in slavery. And the native Missourians said, these kooky Mormons are moving in. They're going to outvote us. We're going to lose our slaves. Get them, hate them, kill them. It's proven. It's proven. It's glossed over for some reason. I don't know why, but it's well-documented. Missouri governor put that. No wonder they were ran out west by handcart. When it came to the Mountain Meadows massacre, let me tell you, all right, to, to a, a 
attribute that to the entire church, you got to be careful going down that road. I mean, because that's pretty, that's a small group of people out west. And you know how the wild, wild west was. But some people use it to attack the church outright. Um, there's a variety of changes and charges and claims that made about other observers and participants. And for some reason, people tend to him to focus on that, but they overlook that extinction order. One, I think one of the only extinction orders ever put out by a governor, sitting governor in the United States of America. So look at the, look at the First Amendment's pursuit of liberty, things like that. So let's go to the purpose of the Trinity, God the Father, Christ, Jesus Christ his Son, and the Holy Spirit. What's the purpose of the Holy Spirit? But for his presence to be, he's a spirit, so his presence can be felt everywhere, right? As a king sends his son, when you deal with the son, you deal with the father. So, yes, they are one in purpose. But even early members of the church, many members of the church, rebuked the Second Council of Nicaea and the subsequent Nicene Creed. So many rebuked it. It, it, was, it was abhorrent to them. Why were there so many councils? I don't know, but it was the... It was, uh, what was the, the last of the seven councils by the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church? No, no, mind you, they're still fighting over things. But one of the things that, while most of the revelations that Joseph Smith gave were instructions, counsel, doctrinal teachings, or, or you know, recovered stories from ancients past, a few contain... A, uh, contained historically specific prophecies about impending events. And those that did usually focused on, you know, global events like leading up to the second coming of Christ, uh, whether or not specific endeavors in which the saints were commanded to participate. But one of his well-known millennial prophecies related to the American Civil War. On December 25th, 1832, he received revelation prophesizing. And mind you, I, 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 there's things in the church that I view as plausible, but why would I stop the Holy Spirit from doing its job, which is witnessing, confirming, and revealing truth? I'm sorry, sir. I would rather trust the Holy Spirit and research things myself, because we're admonished to First Epistle of James chapter 1, verse 5. In the Book of Mormon, the very end, it asks, if you want to know the truthfulness of this work, pray and ask if it's not true. Isn't it fascinating how those three letters completely change things and require the reader, the listener, the hearer, to think about it for themselves, contemplate it, arrive at their own conclusion outside of anyone else's influence but their own, to be witnessed and confirmed. Is that not denying the Holy Ghost when you refuse to listen to the Holy Ghost's promptings? And so, Joseph reiterated his prophecy that a war would break out in South Carolina over the slavery debates, as it did nearly 20 years after Joseph Smith's death. death. And I conceded. Thank you. You conceded 10 seconds. This will begin the fifth and final round for Mr. Slick. Uh, Mr. Slick, whenever you're ready, you may begin. All right, here we go. All right, so you brought up Christophanes are called in the Old Testament. and. Um, uh, well, I've known about them for decades. Uh, you can go to Genesis 3, you can go to Genesis 17, 1, 18, 1, Exodus 6, 2, and 3, Exodus 24, 9 through 11, uh, Numbers 12, 6 through 8. These are, I could quote them all to you. These are theophanies. Uh, you, what you do is you argue sentiment. You don't argue facts. You don't argue scripture. You argue sentiment. And then you, with the very few scriptures you reference, like James 1, 5, you misapply. And you'll also misapply Genesis one twenty six, made men in our image. I quote you where God's, where Jesus says God is spirit. You ignore that. I quote you where Paul the Apostle says that God the Father dwells in unapproachable light whom no man has seen nor can see. You just ignore it. Ignoring it doesn't mean it goes away. The Theophanies, or more accurately, theologically, they're known as Christophanies. Jesus says in John 6, 46, about all of those appearances of God in the Old Testament, not that anyone has seen the Father, except the one who is from God, he has seen the Father. He's talking about himself, the one. He himself has seen the Father. This is what Jesus says in John 6, 46. You don't understand what's going on out there. So governor had a massacre order for everybody? Okay. The Mormons claimed to be the restoration of the truth. They're supposed to be able to teach about all this love, but you like to talk about those kind of things, and that's good. Well, then why did the Mormons themselves murder 124 men, women, and children? Why did they take the, the clothes from the bodies and put them in a barn because they were going to wash them and use them later, but they got so bad they had to uh, – the, the, the decay got so bad they had to um, – 
burn the barn. And then they, why would they charge the people, the family members who came to retrieve their, uh, the young children? These are the Christians, right? The restored gospel truth, right? And then why did the Mormons have the group called the Danites? The Danites were a hit squad that Joseph, excuse me, the second prophet of the Mormon church would say, and this is what he would say, use them up, boys. That was the code. Use them up, boys. That code right there meant that the one that Joseph, that Brigham Young was referring to was to be, well, removed. And when the Danites would come back, they would often come back with gold teeth and watches. And the person was never heard from again. I was actually threatened with, uh, with a, by a Mormon uh, back in Southern California with a Danite uh, threat. <clears throat> Brought up the Trinity. The Trinity is three separate gods in Mormonism. You know, a God the Father, a God the Son, a God the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. In Mormonism, the Holy Spirit is a presence. The Holy Ghost is the personage. Um, <clears throat> things like that. I can get, there's so much to talk about. But you asked, uh, what's the job of the Holy Spirit? Well, Jesus tells us, John 15, 26, when the Helper comes, that's the Holy Spirit, whom I will send to you from the Father. That is the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father. He will testify about me. The Holy Spirit bears witness of Jesus. Now, in Mormonism, Jesus is the brother of the devil, begotten through sexual intercourse between God and his goddess wife, who came from another planet. That is not the Jesus of the Bible. In the Scripture, in Colossians 1, 15 through 17, Jesus is the creator of all things, and he is, and God is uncreated. And <clears throat> in Mormonism, Jesus is a created thing. God's a created thing. They're, it just gets into their intelligences and all this kind of stuff from uh, in Mormon theology, which is logically impossible, infinite regression of causes. It, it, it doesn't make any sense. But <clears throat> what we have in Mormonism is no restoration. One minute remaining. What we have is a false religion that teaches that God came from another planet as a body of flesh and bones, has sexual intercourse with his wife in heaven, makes spirit babies that inhabit human bodies on earth when, at, when you get born. To become a good Mormon, you pay full 10% tithe. You have to pay 10% tithe or you can't go to the temple. The temple recommend handshakes, you get hugs, you get the new name. <clears throat> so hopefully you can become a god of your own planet. The Bible says, there will be no gods formed after me. Go to Isaiah 43, 44, and 45. Check it out. If Mormonism is the restoration of the truth, why did it kill people? Why did it have Danites as a hit squad? Why does it keep changing its doctrines? And why does it keep altering the Book of Mormon? Mormonism is not Christian. It's one of the things warned about by Christ in the last days. Matthew 24, 24, in the last days, many false Christs and false prophets will arise and deceive many. And Joseph Smith is nothing more than one of those false prophets. Go ahead. Thank you very much. That concludes uh, Mr. Slick's final turn, and we will now begin the final turn for Mr. Too High. Too High, uh, whenever you're ready, you may begin. Thank you. One word, allegedly. It's a whole lot of allegations going on, and we live in a country where you're innocent till proven guilty. Joseph Smith rejected the Danite band and referred to them as a secret combination. It's well documented. Look it up yourself. Don't take my word for it. Joseph Smith referred to the Danites as a secret combination. We're referring to Everett's testimony before the judge, B.H. Roberts, and states. This lecture of the doctor revealed for the first time for the true intent of its designs and the brethren he had duped suddenly had their eyes open and at once they revolted and manfully rejected his teachings. Award saw that they had played and lost and so he had said that they'd better let the matter drop where it was. As soon as Avard's villainy was brought to the knowledge of the president of the church, he was promptly excommunicated and afterwards found making an effort to become friends with the mob conspiring against the church. This is the history of the Danite band, which, says the prophet Joseph, died almost before it had an existence. In the New Testament, the Kabbalah of God is frequently described in terms of light, such as a bright cloud at Christ's transfiguration that accompanied the light that emanated from Christ himself. That's Matthew chapter 17. I've given plenty of scriptural references. We can hit the rewind button and go through them individually. It's a further point, if you'd like. The rainbow of John's vision of God in Revelation 4, 3, and most relevantly, the light described by Paul in Acts 22, 1 Timothy 6, 16. 
in and of itself, I just find it fascinating. That in and of itself proves many things that we can see God. I think that in First Timothy 6, 16, immediately after referring to the unapproachable light that God dwells in, Paul notes that no man hath seen nor can see God the Father. The connection between these two statements is obvious. No man has seen nor can can see God the Father because God dwells in light, God's kabod. That is unapproachable by fallen mortal humans. On this point, the evangelical author and theologian Gordon F. Fee agrees. Him no one has seen nor can see, invisible in 117. These clauses reinforce his dwelling in unapproachable light and reflect the cause of the theme. Exodus 33:20. 20. Um, and the emphasis of these last two items is not the Greek one, that God is a noble, but that the Jewish one, that God is so infinitely holy that sinful humanity can never see him and live. That's in the book of Isaiah 6, 1 through 5. That's Gordon F. Lee. You can look it up. The reason that God is unseen by mortal men is that most men are not worthy to behold his face. Sad but true. Rather than describing an immaterial God who is inherently unable to be seen by physical eyes, Paul is describing a God who theoretically can be seen, but who is presently not seen. This is an important distinction. By way of analogy, a rock deep within the mantle of the earth is presently unable to be seen by mortal eyes. The technology doesn't exist to retrieve it, but it is not inherently or metaphysically unable to be seen. The explanation for man's inability to see God the Father does not lie in God's non-physical nature, but in God's location behind a veil of glory impenetrable by mortal human eyes. Relative to humans, God is invisible only in practice, not in absolute reality. Tithing is not mandatory. It's recommended you'll be give, you'll be given blessings by doing it and adhering to it that's between you and god not you and anyone else in god the changes to the book of mormon are minor changes especially compared to what was ripped out of the king james version but my question to you and and I, and I just keep coming back to predestination right versus foreordination or maybe a combination of the both why bother with life What's the purpose in living if God has already chosen his elect? And his elect, I, f I feel as though some people use that as an excuse and crux to go forth in life, casting aspersions, wagging their finger. What did Christ say about the millstone around the neck? It, if you keep someone from coming to Christ, right? If the, final judgment, if the final judgment has yet to occur, would you not want to do anything and everything you can to try to help bring that person to Christ? And it's my opinion and the position I believe. I'm not a representative for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But we follow the admonition of 1 Corinthians 1.10, that we share in a common love of Christ. And when we share in a common love of Christ, there's more in common between us than there ever is to divide us. Real talk. Thank you very much. I guess you're yielding the remainder of your time. That would be 30 seconds remaining. So that concludes the formal moderated portion of the debate. I just want to thank both of our participants, Mr. Slick and Tuhai. This was fantastic. I think you both did a, a wonderful job. I'm sure I'm not the only one who learned a lot, and we have a lot to think about now. So the way we proceed from here is uh, my friend Saigo uh, is prepared um, two polls, which are going to be posted, I suppose, just in the uh, general chat. And uh, I encourage everybody who listened to the debate to vote. Now, it's important to understand these two different questions and that they are distinct questions. The first question is, which participant do you feel did a better job debating, right? Regardless of whether you agreed with them or disagreed with them, who do you think did a better job at the art of debating, right? The second question is, whose position do you agree with or do you more agree with, right? So you might think that Matt did a better job debating, but you agree with too high or vice versa. I think you understand. So we're going to post these two uh, polls, if Saigo is able to do so, uh, in the general chat. We'll allow everybody to vote. There is no winner or loser in roundtable debates, right? The whole point is education and entertainment and just the experience of doing the debate. But it is interesting to see what people think. So please vote. Uh, so again, Saigo, please post that when you're ready. And that being said, uh, the second part of the uh, event is an open discussion slash uh, question and answer. So if anybody wants to comment on the debate uh, or ask a question of either debater or just weigh in on, on these issues, uh, it is now an open floor. Uh, so anybody who wants to speak up, now's your chance. Both the polls have been posted in general chat. Please take the time to locate them and submit your vote. Thank you very much.
Does anybody have a question, perhaps? I have a brief question. I was wondering, um, what connection does the moral character of Mormons have with Mormonism as an ideology or a theology or what have you? What, which connection do members have with Mormonism? This is a Sorry. question, I guess, more directed at Mr. Slick. He seems oh, yes, to spend a lot of time developing the, the moral character of Mormons, and I'm wondering how does the moral character of Mormons have any relevance to the virtues or the vices of Mormonism as a, as a theology or as an ideology or what have you? I'm not sure I understand the question. Can I attempt to, to clarify it? So I think when you were speaking about, for example, the Danites or murders that were carried out by the Mormons, uh, I think his question is, do those actions really... Um, factor into how we assess Mormonism as a theology, right? So in the same way that you might say the acts that are committed by Christians who might have, you know, murdered people in the past, does that really reflect on Christ, right? So I think he's, he's asking, you know, do the evil things that Mormons may have done actually indicate a problem with the Mormon religion, or are these like bad apples that don't reflect the tree, so to speak? Okay. Christianity does not teach killing people, does not teach uh, slicing their throats, ripping their, their teeth out, robbing them. It was uh, Brigham Young, the second prophet of the Mormon Church, who said to the Danites, go use them up. And why? Joseph Smith was teaching, and in Journal of Discourses, volume 13, page 95, he said that anything he said in the pulpit was as good as scripture. This is the second prophet of the Mormon Church. The second prophet of the Mormon Church taught what's called blood atonement. His theology was that you had to have your own sin, your own sins taken care of by the shedding of your own blood. Murder and adultery were not covered by the atonement of Christ, according to him. You had to have your own blood shed. This was the undergirding theological principle that helped justify the Mountain Meadows Massacre and the Danites who continued on. And I have quotes from official Mormon sources about the Danites. It was not Joseph Smith that I mentioned. It was Brigham Young. So Christianity does not teach. You don't find anything in the Bible, in, excuse me, in the New Testament, Christianity, that says go out and kill people. Joseph, Brigham Young did say, hey, go use them up, boys. And you know, they got to sh have their own blood shed in order to atone for their sins. That wasn't, that's not what the Bible teaches. So do you hold that the Crusades were somehow categorically uh, anti-Christian or unjustifiable using the Christian faith? Uh, I have a question. It is in voice text. Someone's two people spoke. I'm confused. Who said what? What's going on? Um, my, I, I have a brief follow up. Do, do you think it's possible? So I, I think it's one thing to have a, a faith or a theology immediately uh, say that some act of violence is permissible, but it, are you claiming that the Christian faith cannot justify any act of the violence, the sort of violence that happened with the, this Mormon case? So something like the Crusades was unjustifiable using the Christian faith. The, cru the Crusades were not biblical. The Crusades were run by the more, the uh, Catholic Church, which is apostate. And I'd be glad to debate on that topic. <clears throat> I debate. I have a, a okay, but mm -hmm. the, Please God. don't interrupt ever. I'm assuming that's not the time to ask your question. When he finishes, you can ask your question. But Jesus did say in Luke twenty two thirty six, he says to pick up a sword, to sell your cloak and get a sword. And that was in the context of self-defense. That's what we have the right, not the obligation, but the right of self-defense. That's as close as you can get. But it was Brigham Young who did teach that people had to have their uh, sins atoned for, certain sins, by the shedding of their own blood, which helped justify the Mountain Meadows Massacre. But let me add this. It looks historically and evidentially, it looks like Brigham Young told the Mormons to be a messenger to just let the wagon train go. That's just going to be fair. It looks like he said, don't do anything My to God. them, let them go. The message didn't My get God. back in time. But it was because of his teaching about blood atonement that helped justify uh, the killing that the Mormons uh, took literally. <clears throat> I, have, I have a question for Stuart. Sure. For who, sorry? Mr. Sir Mattis. I have a question for both of you. So, like, okay, I was so asking it before. Sir, can somebody mute the, the gentleman with the name because he doesn't seem to. That's, that's pretty. That's a small group of people out west. And you know how the wild, wild west was. But some people use it to attack the church outright. 
Um, there's a variety of changes and charges and claims that made about other observers and participants, and for some reason people tend to him to focus on that, but they overlook that extinction order. One, I think one of the only extinction orders ever put out by a governor, sitting governor in the United States of America. So look at the, look at the First Amendment's pursuit of liberty, things like that. So let's go to the purpose of the Trinity: God the Father, Christ, Jesus Christ His Son, and the Holy Spirit. What's the purpose of the Holy Spirit? But for His presence to be, He's a Spirit, so His presence can be felt everywhere, right? As a King sends His Son, when you deal with the Son, you deal with the Father. So yes, they are one in purpose. But even early members of the Church, many members of the Church, rebuked the Second Council of Nicaea and the subsequent Nicene Creed. So many rebuked it. It, it was it was abhorrent to them. Why were there so many councils? I don't know, but it was the. It was, uh, what was the, the last of the seven councils by the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church? No, no, mind you, they're still fighting over things. But one of the things that, while most of the revelations that Joseph Smith gave were instructions, counsel, doctrinal teachings, or, or you know, recovered stories from ancient past, a few contain... A, uh, contained historically specific prophecies about impending events. And those that did usually focused on, you know, global events like leading up to the second coming of Christ, uh, whether or not specific endeavors in which the saints were commanded to participate. But one of his well-known millennial prophecies related to the American Civil War. On December 25th, 1832, he received revelation prophesizing. And mind you, I, 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 there's things in the church that I view as plausible, but why would I stop the Holy Spirit from doing its job, which is witnessing, confirming, and revealing truth? I'm sorry, sir. I would rather trust the Holy Spirit and research things myself, because we're admonished to First Epistle of James chapter 1, verse 5. In the Book of Mormon, the very end, it asks, if you want to know the truthfulness of this work, pray and ask if it's not true. Isn't it fascinating how those three letters completely change things and require the reader, the listener, the hearer, to think about it for themselves, contemplate it, arrive at their own conclusion outside of anyone else's influence but their own, to be witnessed and confirmed. Is that not denying the Holy Ghost when you refuse to listen to the Holy Ghost's promptings? And so, Joseph reiterated his prophecy that a war would break out in South Carolina over the slavery debates, as it did nearly 20 years after Joseph Smith's death. death. And I conceded. Thank you. You conceded 10 seconds. This will begin the fifth and final round for Mr. Slick. Uh, Mr. Slick, whenever you're ready, you may begin. Mr. Slick? I couldn't find my button. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right, here we go. All right, so you brought up Christophanes are called in the Old Testament. And, um, uh, well, I've known about them for decades. Uh, you can go to Genesis 3, you can go to Genesis 17, 1, 18, 1, Exodus 6, 2, and 3, Exodus 24, 9 through 11, uh, Numbers 12, 6 through 8. These are, I could quote them all to you. These are theophanies. Uh, you. What you do is you argue sentiment. You don't argue facts. You don't argue scripture. You argue sentiment. And then you, with the very few scriptures you reference, like James 1.5, you misapply. And you'll also misapply Genesis 1.26, made men in our image. I quote you where God's, or Jesus says God is spirit. You ignore that. I quote you where Paul the Apostle says that God the Father dwells in unapproachable light whom no man has seen nor can see. You would just ignore it. Ignoring it doesn't mean it goes away. The Theophanies, or more accurately, theologically, they're known as Christophanies. Jesus says in John 6, 46, about all of those appearances of God in the Old Testament, not that anyone has seen the Father, except the one who is from God, he has seen the Father. He's talking about himself, the one. He himself has seen the Father. This is what Jesus says in John 6, 46. You don't understand what's going on out there. So governor had a massacre order for everybody. Okay, the Mormons claimed to be the restoration of the truth. They're supposed to be able to teach about all this love. You like to talk about those kind of things, and that's good. Well, then why did the Mormons themselves murder 124 men, women, and children? Why did they take the, the clothes from the bodies and put them in a barn because they were going to wash them and use them later, but they got so bad, they had to, uh, the, the, scent, the decay got so bad, they had to... Um, 
burn the barn. And then they, why would they charge the people, the family members who came to retrieve their, uh, the young children? Th these are the Christians, right? The restored gospel truth, right? And then why did the Mormons have the group called the Danites? The Danites were a hit squad that Joseph, that's good me, the second prophet of the Mormon church would say, and this is what he would say, use them up, boys. That was the code. Use them up, boys. That code right there meant that the one that Joseph, that Brigham Young was referring to was to be, well, removed. And when the Danites would come back, they would often come back with gold teeth and watches. And the person was never heard from again. I was actually threatened with, uh, with a, by a Mormon uh, back in Southern California with a Danite uh, threat. <clears throat> Brought up the Trinity. The Trinity is three separate gods in Mormonism. You know, a God the Father, a God the Son, a God the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. In Mormonism, the Holy Spirit is a presence. The Holy Ghost is the personage. Um, <clears throat> things like that. I can get so much to talk about. But you asked, uh, what's the job of the Holy Spirit? Well, Jesus tells us. John 15, 26, when the helper comes, that's the Holy Spirit, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. The Holy Spirit bears witness of Jesus. Now, in Mormonism, Jesus is the brother of the devil begotten through sexual intercourse between God and his goddess wife who came from another planet. That is not the Jesus of the Bible. In the Scripture, in Colossians 1, 15 through 17, Jesus is the creator of all things. And he is, and God is uncreated. And <clears throat> in Mormonism, Jesus is a created thing. God's a created thing. They're, it just gets into their intelligences and all this kind of stuff from uh, in Mormon theology, which is logically impossible, infinite regression of causes. It, it, it doesn't make any sense. But <clears throat> what we have in Mormonism is no restoration. One minute remaining. What we have is a false religion that teaches that God came from another planet as a body of flesh and bones, has sexual intercourse with his wife in heaven, makes spirit babies that inhabit human bodies on earth when, at, when you get born. To become a good Mormon, you pay full 10% tithe. You have to pay 10% tithe or you can't go to the temple. The temple recommend handshakes, you get hugs, you get the new name. <clears throat> so hopefully you can become a god of your own planet. The Bible says there will be no gods formed after me. Go to Isaiah 43, 44, and 45. Check it out. If Mormonism is the restoration of the truth, why did it kill people? Why did it have Danites as a hit squad? Why does it keep changing its doctrines? And why does it keep altering the Book of Mormon? Mormonism is not Christian. It's one of the things warned about by Christ in the last days. Matthew 24, 24, in the last days, many false Christs and false prophets will arise and deceive many. And Joseph Smith is nothing more than one of those false prophets. Go ahead. Thank you very much. That concludes uh, Mr. Slick's final turn, and we will now begin the final turn for Mr. Too High. Too High, uh, whenever you're ready, you may begin. Thank you. One word, allegedly. It's a whole lot of allegations going on, and we live in a country where you're innocent till proven guilty. Joseph Smith rejected the Danai band and referred to them as a secret combination. It's well documented. Look it up yourself. Don't take my word for it. Joseph Smith referred to the Danites as a secret combination. We're referring to Everett's testimony before the judge, B.H. Roberts, and states. This lecture of the doctor revealed for the first time for the true intent of its designs and the brethren he had duped suddenly had their eyes open and at once they revolted and manfully rejected his teachings. Award saw that they had played and lost and so he had said that they'd better let the matter drop where it was. As soon as Avard's villainy was brought to the knowledge of the president of the church, he was promptly excommunicated and afterwards found making an effort to become friends with the mob conspiring against the church. This is the history of the day night band, which says the prophet Joseph died almost before it had an existence. In the New Testament, the Kabbalah of God is frequently described in terms of light, such as a bright cloud at Christ's transfiguration that accompanied the light that emanated from Christ himself. That's Matthew chapter 17. I've given plenty of scriptural references. We can hit the rewind button and go through them individually. It's a further point, if you'd like. The rainbow of John's vision of God in Revelation 4.3, and most relevantly, the light described by Paul in Acts 22, 1 Timothy 6.16. 
in and of itself, I just find it fascinating. That in and of itself proves many things that we can see God. I think that in First Timothy 6, 16, immediately after referring to the unapproachable light that God dwells in, Paul notes that no man hath seen nor can see God the Father. The connection between these two statements is obvious. No man has seen nor can see God the Father because God dwells in light. God's kabod. That is unapproachable by fallen mortal humans. On this point, the evangelical author and theologian Gordon F. Fee agrees. Him no one has seen nor can see, invisible in 117. These clauses reinforce his dwelling in unapproachable light and reflect the cause of the theme. Exodus 33, 20. Um, and the emphasis of these last two items is not the Greek one, that God is a noble, but that the Jewish one, that God is so infinitely holy that sinful humanity can never see him and live. That's in the book of Isaiah 6, 1 through 5. That's Gordon F. Lee. You can look it up. The reason that God is unseen by mortal men is that most men are not worthy to behold his face. Sad but true. Rather than describing an immaterial God who is inherently unable to be seen by physical eyes, Paul is describing a God who theoretically can be seen, but who is presently not seen. This is an important distinction. By way of analogy, a rock deep within the mantle of the earth is presently unable to be seen by mortal eyes. The technology doesn't exist to retrieve it, but it is not inherently or metaphysically unable to be seen. The explanation for man's inability to see God the Father does not lie in God's non-physical nature, but in God's location behind a veil of glory impenetrable by mortal human eyes. Relative to humans, God is invisible only in practice, not in absolute reality. Tithing is not mandatory. It's recommended you'll be give, you'll be given blessings by doing it and adhering to it that's between you and god not you and anyone else in god the changes to the book of mormon are minor changes especially compared to what was ripped out of the king james version but my question to you and and I, and I just keep coming back to predestination right versus foreordination or maybe a combination of the both why bother with life What's the purpose in living if God has already chosen his elect? And his elect, I, f I feel as though some people use that as an excuse and a crux to go forth in life, casting aspersions, wagging their finger. What did Christ say about the millstone around the neck? It, if you keep someone from coming to Christ, right? If the final, judgment, the final judgment has yet to occur, would you not want to do anything and everything you can to try to help bring that person to Christ? And it's my opinion and the position I believe. I'm not a representative for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But we follow the admonition of 1 Corinthians 1.10, that we share in a common love of Christ. And when we share in a common love of Christ, there's more in common between us than there ever is to divide us. Real talk. Thank you very much. I guess you're yielding the remainder of your time. That would be 30 seconds remaining. So that concludes the formal moderated portion of the debate. I just want to thank both of our participants, Mr. Slick and Tuhai. This was fantastic. I think you both did a, a wonderful job. I'm sure I'm not the only one who learned a lot, and we have a lot to think about now. So the way we proceed from here is uh, my friend Saigo uh, is prepared um, two polls, which are going to be posted, I suppose, just in the uh, general chat. And uh, I encourage everybody who listened to the debate to vote. Now, it's important to understand these two different questions and that they are distinct questions. The first question is, which participant do you feel did a better job debating, right? Regardless of whether you agreed with them or disagreed with them, who do you think did a better job at the art of debating, right? The second question is, whose position do you agree with or do you more agree with, right? So you might think that Matt did a better job debating, but you agree with too high or vice versa. I think you understand. So we're going to post these two uh, polls, if Saigo is able to do so, uh, in the general chat. We'll allow everybody to vote. There is no winner or loser in roundtable debates, right? The whole point is education and entertainment and just the experience of doing the debate. But it is interesting to see what people think. So please vote. Uh, so again, Saigo, please post that when you're ready. And that being said, uh, the second part of the uh, event is an open discussion slash uh, question and answer. So if anybody wants to comment on the debate uh, or ask a question of either debater or just weigh in on, on these issues, uh, it is now an open floor. Uh, so anybody who wants to speak up, now's your chance. 
both the polls have been posted in general chat. Please take the time to locate them and submit your vote. Thank you very much. Does anybody have a question, perhaps? I have a brief question. I was wondering, um, what connection does the moral character of Mormons have to, with Mormonism as an ideology or a theology or what have you? What, which connection do members have with Mormonism? It, no, this is a Sorry. question, I guess, more directed to Mr. Slick. He seems oh, yes, to spend a lot of time developing the, the moral character of Mormons, and I'm wondering how does the moral character of Mormons have any relevance to the virtues or the vices of Mormonism as a, as a theology or as an ideology or what have you? I'm not sure I understand the question. Can I attempt to, to clarify it? So I think when you were speaking about, for example, the Danites or murders that were carried out by the Mormons, uh, I think his question is, do those actions really... Um, factor into how we assess Mormonism as a theology, right? So in the same way that you might say the acts that are committed by Christians who might have, you know, murdered people in the past, does that really reflect on Christ, right? So I think he's, he's asking, you know, do the evil things that Mormons may have done actually indicate a problem with the Mormon religion, or are these like bad apples that don't reflect the tree, so to speak? Okay. Christianity does not teach killing people, it does not teach uh, slicing their throats, ripping their, their teeth out, robbing them. It was uh, Brigham Young, the second prophet of the Mormon Church, who said to the Danites, go use them up. And why? Joseph Smith was teaching, and in Journal of Discourses, volume 13, page 95, he said that anything he said in the pulpit was as good as scripture. This is the second prophet of the Mormon Church. The second prophet of the Mormon Church taught what's called blood atonement. His theology was that you had to have your own sin, your own sins taken care of by the shedding of your own blood. Murder and adultery were not covered by the atonement of Christ, according to him. You had to have your own blood shed. This was the undergirding theological principle that helped justify the Mountain Meadows Massacre and the Danites who continued on. And I have quotes from official Mormon sources about the Danites. It was not Joseph Smith that I mentioned. It was Brigham Young. So Christianity does not teach. You don't find anything in the Bible, in, excuse me, in the New Testament, Christianity, that says go out and kill people. Joseph, Brigham Young did say, hey, go use them up, boys. And you know, they got to have their own blood shed in order to atone for their sins. That wasn't, that's not what the Bible teaches. So do you hold that the Crusades were somehow categorically uh, anti-Christian or unjustifiable? using the Christian faith. Uh, I have a question. It is in voice text. <clears throat> Someone's two people spoke. I'm confused. Who said what? What's going on? Um, my, I, I have a follow up. Do, do you think it's possible? So I, I take it it's one thing to have a, a faith or a theology immediately uh, say that some act of violence is permissible. But it, are you claiming that the Christian faith cannot justify any act of the violence, the sort of violence that happened with the, this Mormon case. So something like the Crusades was unjustifiable using the Christian faith. The, the Crusades were not biblical. The Crusades were run by the, Mor the uh, Catholic Church, which is apostate. And I'd be glad to debate on that topic. <clears throat> I debate. I have a, a okay, but then, oh please God. don't interrupt ever. <clears throat> That's not the plan to ask your question when he finishes you can ask your question but jesus did say in luke twenty two thirty six, 36 he says to pick up a sword to sell your cloak and get a sword and that was in the context of self-defense that's what we have the right not the obligation but the right of self-defense that's as close as you can get but it was brigham young who did teach that people had to have their uh, sins atoned for certain sins by the shedding of their own blood which helped justify the Mountain Meadows Massacre. But let me add this. It looks historically and evidentially, it looks like Brigham Young told the Mormons to be a messenger to just let the wagon train go. That's just going to be fair. It looks like he said, don't do anything My to God. them. Let them go. The message didn't My get God. back in time. But it was because of his teaching about blood atonement that helped justify uh, the killing that the Mormons uh, took literally. <laughs> I, have, I have a question for Slick. Sure. For who, sorry? Mr. Um, Slick. Sir Mattis. 
<laughs> I have a question for both of you, so like, okay, I was so asking it before. Sir, can somebody mute the, the gentleman with the input, because he doesn't seem to understand when someone else has asked a question or someone else is speaking. Like, uh, I, uh, I asked it before, right, so like, is it my turn now? <clears throat> okay, so Mattis, you hold on, and yes, you go ahead and ask your question. Like, I have loaded in VC. <clears throat> you have to ask it verbally, you don't write it. If you're going to ask a question, speak. Like you can see in the VC, like it would be hard okay. To so like... we will. We're gonna mute you out here. You had a chance. Okay, we're moving on. Okay, then. Uh, my question is: Why do you believe in? Um, I assume you're as a Calvinist. Do you believe in um, uh, salvation by faith alone? Yes, per Romans three twenty eight, Romans four five, Romans five one, Galatians two sixteen. Yep. Oh wow! I didn't actually know there were verses to back this up. Could you? Uh, could you give me some of those? Romans 3, 28, we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Romans 4, 5, to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Romans 5, 1, having therefore been justified by faith. Okay, that should do it. But, I mean, do you believe that, say, like, if Hitler had a deathbed conversion that he was, and he didn't confess any of his sins, as a Catholic would, do you think that faith would justify Hitler? What does the Bible say? We're having therefore been justified by faith. Do you agree with the Bible or not? I think I think you're missing out on an interpretation because Christ gave the apostles the power to um to forgive sins. And no, he didn't. He didn't. Now you go to John twenty twenty three on this Matthew sixteen, eighteen, and all that stuff. I can argue with Catholics about it, but no, he didn't do that. It's a misnomer. If you want to have a debate on Catholicism, that's fine. But we're talking Mormonism right now. <clears throat> Yeah, I have a Mormon-related question. My question is to the Mormon guy. Um, how do you answer the question about who created God, since the Mormonism stipulates that God was created? So, who created God, and how do you reconcile that? Oh, that's a that's a good good question. So the and, and like I said, I'm I'm not a representative of the church. Um, so. Mainstream Christianity teaches that God created the universe from nothing, right? Uh, Mormons teach that God organized the universe from pre-existing matter. And so the LDS gods therefore claim to be different than the mainstream God of Christianity, or in some some views, unbiblical. But the concept of, of, of uh, what is it, ex nihilo, is not, and, and Mr. Slick is the expert in the. Uh, the old languages, not not I, but it's not taught in the Old or New Testaments or by the early Christian fathers, unless one assumes it. And so the doctrine was a novel idea that altered the beliefs and doctrines of the Jews and early Christians. And so um, I think very clearly that you know when when God began to create the heavens and the earth, the earth being without form and void and darkness was on the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the surface of the waters. God said, let there be light. The first act of creation then is a command for light to exist, and all the rest, the earth is a desert wasteland, and, you know, etc., etc., uh, comes from there. The New Testament doesn't provide much additional help in resolving the issue, and so therefore I, I like the idea that we are very similar to God the Father, Right, he made us in His image, and and even before I became LDS, I always believed that if if God made man in the image of Himself, and man made technology in the image of Himself, well, there's a lot of overlap, right? And so um, I think that um, it, it, I'm I'm okay with the idea of God, and and you know our view and my my belief. I'll, I'll just say my belief um, is that God went through a similar test that we are going through and he proved himself worthy to have his own family um the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints is really the only church that uh, most closely resembles if you just want to compare scientifically all the things we now know about the ancient church that god is uh, that jesus christ established and you compare it to every church in the world today there's only one that most closely resembles it and it's the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints and so the idea of a personage, tangible personage God, if if that was the case, then why did they spend so much time in the multiple councils of Nicaea and the subsequent Nicene Creed trying to define God as a spirit so that would fit the concept of Greek philosophy? The, 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 Greek philosophy is incompatible with the idea of a tangible personage of God. Um, and so and in order to win 
converts, they changed the nature of God in order to appease the Greeks and to accept them as converts, in my opinion. So I just want to take a moment to mention that now that we've had a little bit of time for the votes, uh, they haven't closed yet. You can still make your vote, but it'd be interesting to note that it is a perfect tie uh, with 11 votes uh, saying they agreed with two highest position and 11 votes saying they agreed with Mr. Slick's position. And as regards who uh, was judged to do a better job, uh, there's a, a, a slight majority uh, favoring too high. But um, again, a uh, very close uh, debate. So thank you guys both again for the excellent job. Uh, I have a quick question for Matt. Hey, would it be okay if I uh, insert one in real fast, Mattis? Here, go ahead. Um, also for Matt. Um, so one of the things I've always been kind of interested in with some of these branch off religions like Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, things like that, is there always seems to be this kind of facade of sweetness, right? This this kind of artificial happiness that you see that, um, from what I hear, is actually mandated by the church, that the individuals in the church are supposed to act in a certain way that would result in the highest number of converts. Um, at the same token, I also kind of keep hearing from too high side this notion where he kind of keeps saying, I'm, you know, not speaking on behalf of the church. I'm not, not speaking on behalf, almost like there's this fear of repercussion type of thing. If he says something wrong, which kind of speaks to the idea of this kind of cult like behavior that you were mentioning before as well. So what I was curious about with you is based on your interactions with the Mormon church and kind of the Dan Knights, as you were speaking about, is that accurate? This kind of facade of, um, kind of happiness and sweetness. Yes. Uh, I forgot the statistics, but, uh, Back in the 90s, I think it was, Utah had the highest rate of fraud, extortion. I don't know if extortion is right, but fraud. And uh, uh, women on uh, medications, uh, depression, and other things. And it's swept under the rug. Because, uh, you know, in Mormonism, in order to be saved, you know, 2 Nephi 25, 23, you're saved by grace through faith after all you can do. And in Moroni 1034, or is it 1032, excuse me, uh, if you deny yourself of all ungodliness, then is God's grace sufficient for My you. Gosh. And then you go to Deuteronomy, uh, not Deuteronomy, but DNC, Doctrine and Covenants 82 7. If you sin, a sin that's, that you were forgiven of earlier, all your former sins come back to you. So this kind of a thing puts a great weight of depression upon people because they're not good enough. They don't have any hope in Mormonism. So they're told to be nice, they're told to be smiling, they're told to put on a good front. And then you find all kinds of problems in Mormonism. And uh, we've got all kinds of anecdotal evidence from people over the years who told me what was going on. I've been doing this for 40 years. And I'll tell you, I, 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 I got stories. <laughs> I got stories about what Mormons did to their families. I got stories up the wazoo about how Mormonism treated people when they left Mormonism, costing them everything. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's not Christian. God is not an exalted man from another planet that makes him an alien. The guy didn't answer the question, where did, God, where did their God come from? Think about this. In Mormonism, God is created by his God, who is created by his God, created by his God, and it goes back infinitum. That's logically impossible. You cannot have an infinite regression of uncaused cause or of causation. I can get into the logic of why, but it's just yet another area that falls apart inside of Mormonism. I mean, I could talk for hours on Mormonism, but go ahead. Uh, so I have a question for Matt. Yeah. Um, if you could ask your, your opponent here, uh, too high, any one question that he couldn't avoid, what would it be? Well, I don't know. It's a good question. Um, except maybe this. Uh, are your sins forgiven right now? All of your sins right now? Oh, uh, can I can I say yes? Absolutely. Um, if we if we all have the light of Christ within us and it never fully goes out, we're all going to heaven, aren't we? The atonement is sufficient for all, and so that's where the varying degrees of glory and how close we get to the heavenly Father comes in, and well documented in the New Testament. Well, the problem with that is that the scripture, your scriptures, say if you sin one more thing, one time. Doct uh, Doctrine and Covenants 82.7, if you've been forgiven of something and you sin the same thing again, all of your former sins come back. So have you never sinned the same sin twice? That's a good, that's a good question. Um, I've never heard anyone in the church tell me there's a standard by which we should act. Um, 
I, I've never heard anyone tell me that, uh, you know, if, cause, cause it's, it, it's obtuse. It goes completely against the whole, our whole respect of free will and agency. The difference here is you believe in predestination. You believe all, all is already said and done. It's already done. You're one of choice elect of God. So therefore you feel emboldened to go out and tell people who isn't, isn't going to hell. Whereas we believe final judgment has yet to occur. There's still time for us to repent. You know, when we, what if people grew up and lived on an island? Never heard about Jesus, right? Where are they going to learn about Christ? Well, they'll do it in paradise. Once we die, we go to paradise. Time is a little different. Uh, that's why it's imperative we learn all we can now. But everyone's basically saved. Everyone's going to heaven. And to for anyone, really, to sit back and try to say who is and who isn't going to heaven and put themselves as a judge of Israel unrighteously, you got to be careful. I believe that's the waystone that was uh, the millstone that we have to be careful around our neck. Um, I have a question for two I. Yes, sir. Could could you support um verses that lead to your belief in that everyone goes to heaven? Well, we believe in the telestial, terrestrial, and celestial kingdoms, right? One having the degrees and glory of the stars, the other having the degrees and glories of the moon, the other ones have the degrees and glory of the uh, uh, the sun. It's in the New Testament. Um, as far as, uh, yeah, let's see, I can pull you up some there. I'll put, I'll put uh, the I had a question. I, I had a question. Uh, yes. For both of you, but practically for Matt, right? If he's still here. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, first of all, I wish you well after I heard that you had uh, a disease and uh, your family as well. Thanks, <laughs> Yeah. So, so my question was, um, you have stated repeatedly that God takes away the sins for whom he died for, right? So yes. my question is, is that conditional? As in, does the Bible present it as, I don't want to get into an argument, I just want to ask a question. Does God present it as an if? The sins are forgiven only if one believes. Colossians 2.14 says that Jesus canceled the kerographon, the certificate of debt consisting of decree, decrees, which was hostile to us. He's taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. What was he talking about? The previous verse says, having forgiven us all no, our no, I'm asking, no, I'm, I'm asking the question. Is it conditional or non-conditional? Mike on. Hey, David, no, you're not going to do that, right? He's in the middle of answering your question. Your question. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I apologize. But I, I'm... Bye, David. <laughs> all right. Yeah, that was... Continue. I heard, uh, so you're I, was, I, was, I was prepping the answer. I was going to lay it out because his question was the wrong question. He didn't understand the issues. I was going to correct his error. You can respond in whatever way you, you feel uh, is fitting, Mr. Slick, but we're not going to give that gentleman another turn on the mic. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, okay, uh, so I'm very curious to both of you if you have any experience in the... Uh, religion and polygamy uh and how you feel about it and what's going on in the past years if you have any experience with it in the religion and it and how you feel about it i'll let mr slick go go uh, first if, and I, if, I, my God. if i saw another wife my wife would kill me so no no experience with <laughs> <it>. <laughs> okay. very good um to me, uh, personally, no. Have I have I talked and met with people? Yes. Have we seen it in our culture? Yes. I think that polygamy was one of those things to where it was allowed in certain instances when uh, you know there's a lack of good people. I think it was more predominant after the uh, governor of Missouri um, set forth the extinction order: shoot on sight, men, women, children, Mormons, and there was uh, actually a gentleman who lost his wife um and he had two twins and he went to joseph and emma smith and said i can't take care of them and take care of myself would you please adopt them and um there were so many broken families um i think in the purpose of if it's done for sexual purposes and gratification um the uh the not probably not doing it for the right reason but the law of the land supersedes all all right and so 
Um, very quickly, the practice of, it, of polygamy, if you're found in the church, hey, you're excommunicated, do not pass code, do not click $200. Now, as far as the other sects and people who purport to clone, claim themselves, like the FLDS, most most prominent ones, uh, what was his name? The, the guy in prison, uh, Jeff, whatever. Um, yeah, that that's just crazy. I mean, that's just nuts. Like, I, I agree with Mr. Slick here. Um, if you think you can put up with more than one spouse at a time, knock yourself out. But um, I personally think it's 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 not necessary. But I don't know. I mean, you know, God's purposes are His purposes, and so therefore, um, I, I would I would fundamentally and categorically uh, reject anyone that engage in harming anyone, especially those that deserve their innocence, uh, such as children. So, but you you uh, believe that people should be able to have more than one wife? Oh, but it's no. Not no, I think that, um, you know, and it's funny because I heard somebody call up on a radio station one day many, many years ago. This was during the Proposition 8 in California issue. Um, they said that, you know, if they're going to let people have same-sex marriages and let people uh, marry inanimate objects, I should be able to have more than one wife if, if, mm-hmm. if I want to. And I think he was trolling quite frankly. And I think the the point was taken. But no, I personally find it to be abhorrent. I don't I don't see any point in it. I, I don't think I think our laws are absolute and, and should be absolute. And those that, uh, you know, like I said, in the church, the practice it are excommunicated. And then when it has to deal with uh, in any way, shape or form, harming someone that is a minor under age, they deserve to be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. And that's that's shared by the church. It's it's you know, it's not common. It does happen. I mean, you move out in the middle of nowhere. It's like the uh, the Russian Jesus, you know, that guy uh, who claims to be to be the second coming of Christ. You know, he's out in Siberia. He's practicing polygamy in a, in a cult like manner. And so, uh, yeah, those are things that you have to be careful with. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, I have a question for Matt and Too High. Go ahead, Mattis. Uh, if this is a touchy subject, so if you don't want to answer, feel free not to. But uh, who did you vote for in 2016, and who will you be voting for in 2020? <laughs> I don't know who I voted for in 2016. I'm, I'm a constitutionalist. I just went to the Constitutionalist Party. And I'm not sure who I'm going to vote for uh, this coming up uh, Tuesday. It won't be Biden, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, is there anybody who hasn't had a chance yet to ask a question uh, who might wish to uh, get one in? Uh, yes. I want to ask too high. What is your thoughts on Protestantism and, and at least for... For Matt Slick, what is your thoughts on John Calvin? Well, you know, there's one thing that we haven't brought up, and it's that, you know, Calvinists had death squads. The Calvinist cadets teach that when the church was founded, they hunted apostates. Calvin dismissed the data from the New Testament and decided that the moral laws of the old covenant laws of the Torah still applied, and killing people who perverted his pure doctrines was a moral necessity. He specifically justified capital punishment of heretics with Leviticus 24.16. The one who blasphemies in the name of the Lord shall be put to death. All the congregation must stone him. Any foreigner or native who blasphemies the name shall be put to death. He said he could not individually put anyone to death, but he set his followers to determine who needed to die. They would feel it in their spirit and act without hesitation. Then backtracking, he requested beheadings of specific persons. I am persecuted that it is not without the special will of God that apart from any verdict of judges that criminals have endured protracted torment at the hands of the executioner. Calvin's letter to Pharrell on the 24th of July. He wanted the killings to be torture, not just killings, but he called for people to be ripped apart piece by piece over hours. And so therefore, I don't think that's a just example of someone who purports to follow Christ. By their fruit, ye shall know them. And so to say that Mormons and Mormonism, is, is they're just nice because they're controlled to do so, is an absolute fallacy. It's so obtuse. It's just asinine. I think that these people, and I remember when I was baptized, my father remarked, he says, you know, and, and they were Mormon. I didn't grow up in a Mormon family. I grew up Baptist. I, I was Catholic for a year. I went through church tour all my life, right? And he remarked, he says, I've never been around a group of people I've wanted to be around more in my life. 
And I found that fascinating. It, it, it very, very much touched me personally to confirm to me. The thing that confirmed me that this work is true, that this church is the restoration, that it was necessary, was the 1900 years of violence that ensued after, not even before Christ died. I mean, right in the garden, they couldn't even stay awake with them. Is that bad? And so why should we believe anyone who stood up and says, I'm a Christian, I got a Christian next to my name, I like the cross, I like the cross, I like the Roman symbol of Christ's death, that we should just, you know, bring them at face value. We have to be very judicious in how we approach each other. And I think, once again, if we focus more on finding a common love of Christ than we do trying to fault find and 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 deride and divide, we may be able to accomplish all things. And and I'm 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 lo- I love the fact that in March third, all of the main churches are coming together to work to protect the family. And I think this is the great res- restoration in that it's self fulfilled that Christ will come and bring all of His churches in line. Um, I have a question, I suppose. Uh, this would be for too high. Um, is it true that if you fail to um, become married and have a family, you sort of suffer a loss in the afterlife? Because of this, you can't obtain uh, your full spiritual potential, so to speak, if you are unable to you know, have a wife and children? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, absolutely. So we are certainly, yes, the, the family is instrumental foundation and in, in, in key to the plan of salvation, right? It was one of the first things that the Lord admonished Adam and Eve, go be fruitful and multiply. Man was not meant to be alone. Of course, it's not possible for everyone to find a suitable person to marry. And some people have said that the church devalues those that are not married or don't have children and there's a significant portion of adult church members that are single people, and their challenges and lifestyles are somewhat different than those of married members. And it's very similar to me, the ideas and realities of people who grew up in the church versus those who convert. At the end of the day, they make that choice. They exercise their free will and agency. They, The time will come when the Lord will bless all of his father's children with every blessing he can, including eternal marriages for the people who live their lives single. And so there's justice for all. It's like I said of the person that grew up on an island and never learned about Jesus. Where is his justice, right? So um, some of the statements of the church leaders, they said there, there are uh, temporary states in the eternal grand scheme of things, not always in mortality, but righteous yearning and longing will be fulfilled. So it's, it's maybe a test. I think single people serving in the gospel, um, if, if I died right now, for example, when I wasn't married. And I'm, I'm Joe Schmo. I went through life kind of ho-hum the best I could. If Mother Teresa, who we all probably agree, did a lot of really good for a lot of people, she definitely deserves to be blessed a lot more than myself. And I have no problem with that because you know what? My salvation is between me and God, not anyone else. And so you have to be careful when anyone tries to control you or control your thoughts or to define things. It completely goes against the first epistle of James, chapter 1, verse 5. It goes against the whole gift and purpose of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost's greatest gift is to witness, confirm, and reveal truth. And so I love the fact that we're all able to receive. We're able to have a personal relationship with the Heavenly Father. And we're able to find answers and have confirmation of truths made known unto us. Thank you. I have a question. Um... It's for too high. So how would you say um, agency is more important to the gospel and God's plan for his children than predestination? Like, why should someone believe in agency over predetermination or predestination? That's a good question, because that's a, an area of disagreement among Christians is whether we have agency and thus some measure of control over our salvation, um, or whether uh, God has predestined our fate. The argument's not a new one, and was also known in early Judaism as well as medieval Islam. Even. The problem is complicated by the fact that some scriptures and other texts seem to suggest that God has given us agency, while some have been read as evidence for predestination. Um, 
Augustine, uh, the Bishop of Hippo, North Africa, foremost authority of Roman Catholic theologian of the time, from his reading of the Bible and responding to various uh, heretical teachings, he developed some of the basic teachings that Western Christianity. He concluded that as a result of Adam's fall, man is totally depraved and cannot do anything to save himself. Because of this depravity, man is incapable of having faith in God and consequently no free will. I, and, and though Luther and other reformers taught predestination, John Calvin was its foremost proponent during the time of the Protestant Reformation. And many adherents to today's Protestant evangelical movement leaders lean heavily on Calvin, though not all evangelical Christians believe in predestination. Calvinistic uh, belief is expressed by the acronym TULIP, which stands for each principle, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, um, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. And so we could go through you know, each one of those independently, and I'm happy to do so. Um, you know, This is a topic I'm, I'm certainly have not been well versed in doing this as long as uh, my esteemed colleague, Mr. Slick here, and I you know, am very grateful. Uh, to him and his time. I've, I've really enjoyed it, and I think and I hope everyone else has as well. And I hope that we can continue to have these types of discussions, not debates, but discussions to wherewith we can share our perspectives and exercise that agency unto each other to try to draw closer together to the Lord and, and implement the plan of salvation for our lives. Um, we believe as members that the age of accountability is age eight, that that is the point to when people have um, their sins, have um, the, it, it takes hold. And it's interesting because I was baptized Baptist when I was eight. And I, that's why I said I remember I got home and I saw a commercial for the Book of Mormon, another testament of Jesus Christ. And I said to myself at that moment, I got angry at first, but then I said, wait a second, where do bad thoughts come from? And then I said, okay, maybe it's plausible that they have an, anything else that Jesus said. I'll give them the benefit of the doubt just so that – and I look back now and be honest with you, you and me. I think the Holy Spirit smacked me upside the head and said, you got to have an open mind and heart so I can do my job, which is to witness, confirm, and reveal truth. And so I think it's an individual thing, and I think that in and of itself proves that we have our free will and agency. And some people even agree that there is a mixture um, of – of, of predestination, foreordination, and our agency. We're the great variable in the universe, right? We can align our will to that of the Heavenly Father, our own, or the adversary. Oh, come and on. so I think that's kind of the, because like I said, if everything was already predetermined and made up, then what's the point of living, in my opinion? Um, I have a question for um, Too High. Like, life so, just happens? Um, why do like, people you just get older and older? God! Why why not? Well, it's a very special thing to... Because if God made man in the image of himself, I think the common thread of... It doesn't matter if you're Mormon or even Christian, right? Even atheists believe in some way, deep down, they'll admit that they kind of hope to expect to be with their family. Like, why would we come here to establish the relationships we do with friends and family for just to go away when we die? And so I think um, if we really adhere and strive and become like unto God, our whole purpose is to become more Christ-like, to emulate him in our life. And so, you know, each of us, along with Jesus, are, are spirit children of a Father in heaven. And our personality and character were developed during the long pre-mortal existence. And so during that time, the Savior, who was the firstborn of the Father, uh, developed the attributes that allowed God, the Father, to trust Jesus with the creation of all things that would be created and to assume the divine role of the Son. It's the same process that Lucifer developed the attributes that led him into sin and rebellion. The difference between Jesus and Lucifer is so great that we can't fully understand it. The rest of God's children are somewhere in between the two extremes, and because of Jesus' role in the creation of Satan's premortal powers and stat statuses, we're dependent upon the creative power and authority of God exercised through Jesus Christ. And so the difference between those who followed the Father and followed Lucifer is part dependent upon the eternal aspect of each individual. And that may help explain uh, Satan's uh, antipathy towards Jesus and his desire to usurp the power and authority of God. And, and then to, to claim that Jesus and Satan were merely peers misunderstands and misrepresents the LDS doctrine, I think, and Christ's preeminent role in it, um, 
we're going to find out eventually. And we can receive an individual uh, confirmation of that by the power of the Holy Spirit and personal revelation. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm totally cool. And, and when I became a father, this really, really hit home. When, when our youngest was learning to walk, he fell down. I'd pick him up. He'd fell, fall down again. I'd pick him up again. But that third time, I had to wait and stop myself and frame myself and say, if I don't let him learn how to pick himself up, he'll never learn. And it was at that moment, I kind of felt a little bit more kind of like God, you know, and, and as we, sh- we, we appreciate God. him and we give him credit, credit and glory to, to even being able to sit here and talk and breathe. You know, I have, I have a good friend of mine is tinnitus and I wish I would give anything for him to be able to share in just the most basic uh, blessings and abilities that, that we take for granted. And um, so, so yeah, thank you to everyone for, for your time and your patience. And I'm always open for questions. And, and, and like I said, um, Mr. Slick, thank you for your time and your patience. It's been an absolute uh, honor and a privilege and, and look forward to uh, everything in the future. Okay. I agree. Uh, that was a fantastic um, debate. Hopefully we can do uh, more events with both of you gentlemen in the future, uh, either debates, uh, open discussions. Uh, I would still like to do an interview with Mr. Slick uh, at some time in the future. Uh, But perhaps this is a good time to uh, wrap the podcast up. We've covered a lot of ground. So again, thank you to our participants. Thank you to everybody who attended and listened live. And thank you to everybody who voted. Um, It was a great debate and a very close debate as well. So uh, before we wrap up, I'll just remind you to please follow and subscribe to our Roundtable podcast on YouTube and on BitChute. You can also find our podcast in the RT podcast channel of the server. And uh, we have over 200 episodes there for you to enjoy on all kinds of different topics. We record a podcast at least once every day, uh, usually at 8 p.m. Central. And again, all of this takes place on the Roundtable Discord server. So please come and join us uh, where all the magic happens. Thank you, Mr. Slick. Thank you, Too High. Thank you, everybody. And God bless. We'll see you again tomorrow at the same time for a debate, or sorry, a podcast with Jigmo on the topic of animal rights. Keep an eye on the announcements channel for our upcoming events. So thanks again, everybody. Have a good night. We will now jump up to roundtable one, and we can continue to chat for the remainder of the evening.